Turning your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. We're looking this morning, of course, continuing this morning, our study of the book of Daniel. Daniel is, of course, a Jewish man. When he was a young boy taken into captivity by the Babylonians, taken in the empire, he lived his entire life away from Israel, from, from his hometown. And uh, we're now near the end of his life. Daniel has served, has served in the Babylonian Empire for about 70 years, and now the Babylonian Empire has fallen, and the Medio Persian Empire has come. And what is so amazing in Daniel, close to 90 years old, has been raised up to a position in the Medio Persian Empire, even as a 90 year old man. And we continue to see his character, because this is what we've seen throughout his whole life. He's been the same from a young boy to an old man, a man who lived for God. We're going to see that this morning that God once again provides and protects Daniel as he lives for God in a pagan world. That's what we're going to see over and over. This morning, it's a famous story. One of the other famous stories in the book of Daniel is Daniel in the lion's den. And we'll see what happens as we focus on his character. Let me begin with a question, and that is, what is faith? Sometimes we'll say to people, you say, you just have faith in Jesus Christ, or you, you, you believe this, or faith. People say, well, what is faith? And I've had people try to d define faith, and sometimes they can't do it. But faith, very simply, is this. Faith is taking God at his word. That's what it is. It's trusting God to do what he says, or taking God at his word. When we say, by faith we have eternal life, when we trust in Jesus, what we mean by that is, we believe Jesus died and rose, died and rose again, and we trust in him. We have faith in him that he will give to us eternal life. When we think about faith, whether it's in our, the eternal life which comes by faith or even the Christian life is a walk of faith. It, and we trust God day by day living uh, our lives based on the word of God that he's going to provide our needs, that he'll never leave us or forsake us. What shall we do? You realize the Bible is full of promises and we could ask this question, does God always do what he promises? The answer, of course, is yes, always. Always does what he promises. We must trust God even when things don't look, when we don't know the outcome or when they don't, they don't look like they're going to turn out our way. Think about it back in Daniel chapter 3. We had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were, the, the, the deal was everybody had to bow down before this statue. But they weren't going to bow down before a statue because they said, we believe in the true God. And we're not bowed down and worshiping any statue. And they said, if you don't bow down, you'll be thrown into the, to the fiery furnace. And they said, well, you know, whether our God will deliver us or not is not even the question. He could if he wants to. He may not. May or may not. But we're not going to bow down. And, of course, they threw him in the fiery furnace and God protected him. Well, now in Daniel chapter 6, it's the same thing. Because there's a decree given that you can only pray to the king, which is Darius, for the next 30 days. And anybody praying to any other god will be thrown in the lion's den. And Daniel had to make a decision. And Daniel says, listen, whether God would deliver me from the lion's den or not, I don't know. All I know is I'm going to pray every day like I always do. And I'm not praying to some king. I'm praying to the true God. So, and here's the deal. We don't, Daniel does not know what God's going to do. That doesn't change the fact that he's going to continue to pray to God. That's, that's his plan. So he will trust and obey, and that's one of the things for us. This is how we live the Christian life. We have the Word of God. There are truths and principles that we live by, and we have to trust God and obey the Word and live it out as we trust God as we go through our lives. Well, this morning in chapter 6, Daniel has to trust God. Let's remember the context. Daniel's been raised up by God, to a high position of authority in the medial Persian Empire. We don't have any details on how this happened. When we, we end chapter 5 with the fall of the Babylonian Empire, we start chapter 6, and a king by the name of Darius is ruling, and he's got Daniel connected there with him. He's an older man, maybe in his 90s. I mean, if he was, if he was uh, 15 or 20 when he was taken into captivity, the Babylonian Empire lasted 70 years, so he's close to 85 to 90, probably at the youngest. He's seen empires come and empires go. He has served under three different kings, under Nebuchadnezzar, under Belshazzar, and now a king by the name of Darius. We think that Arias is the Mede, Cyrus is the Persian 
Persian, they call him the Medio Persian Empire. Cyrus, we think, is the ruling king over everything, and Darius is the ruler over this section of the province or of the kingdom, and that's where he is. We looked at the outline last week, just so you get an idea of how this thing flowed. We said that, he was, that, that, that Daniel was favored by Darius, but then he got framed by his enemies, and we'll see that, and then he's faithful to God because he keeps praying. This morning, we're going to see, starting at verse 16, that he's thrown into the lines, and then we see he's freed by the king. And what happens? How does all this happen? So I want you to look back at chapter 6, look at verse 1, and we get the quick overview. 6-1, it seemed good to Darius, this is chapter 6, verse 1, seemed good to Darius, he's now that king who appointed 120 satraps, that's rulers, over the kingdom, they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. And then he had three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one. So out of all these rulers, the big king says, i got 120 people, of these 120, I'm going to pick three out. One of those happens to be this old man named Daniel who's Jewish who was in a former kingdom, but he's so amazing, I've raised him up to that position. God is working in all of this. It says in verse 3 that Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners, the traps, because he, was, he was possessed an extraordinary spirit. God's working in his life, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. He said, I'm going to make Daniel number one out of all the rulers. Well, we know that immediately the the other guys, the other rulers didn't like that at all, especially those other two that were going to be appointed as well. And so they're, they're upset. And so in verse 4 it says, Then the commissioners of the traps began to try to find some ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to the government affairs. But they could find no ground of corruption or evidence of corruption in his or accusation or evidence of corruption as much he was faithful. No negligence or corruption was found in him. But look, they said, let's find something that Daniel's doing wrong. We'll go to the king and we'll get him kicked out. Well, they couldn't find Daniel doing anything wrong. He was a great worker. He did everything for the glory of God, and he was a, a, a great worker. And you know, when you think about it, that's what we're supposed to do. Our goal is to do our jobs as unto the Lord. Colossians 3.23 says, that whatever we do, do it as unto the Lord, seeking to please God rather than to please men. Think about what it would be like if we did all of our jobs as Christians. We did them as if we were doing directly for our Savior. And we did them not to please men, but to please God and do it even better. Well, that's what Daniel did. Well, they said, that's not going to work. We can't find anything against him. So verse 5 says, then these men said, we'll not find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to his law. They knew that he believed in the God of Israel and they worshiped the God of Israel and he prayed to the God of Israel. So they came up with this plan and the guys came together and they came before the king and they said, oh king, uh, all of us, now that was a lie, Daniel wasn't in on this, all of us think that the best thing is you saw, you're such a great king for the next 30 days, people can only pray to you. And if anybody prays to any other God or any other thing, they'll get thrown in the lion's den. And the king said, sounds like a great idea. Because, you know, who would not want to be worshipped? He said, yeah, I'd like to be worshipped. I am a great king, and so this would be a good thing. Now, we talked about this last week, that in the Babylonian Empire, if you got in trouble, they threw you in the fiery furnace. In the Medio Persian Empire, if you got in trouble, they threw you in the lion's den. And so that's what's going to happen. And so everything looks real good, so they signed the law. And... Daniel is not going to stop his praying to God. In fact, we find that according to the Mosaic law, most religious, when we say uh, fired up type Jewish people, they would pray at 9 o'clock in the morning, which was the morning sacrifice. They would pray at 12 o'clock, and then they would pray again at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was the evening sacrifice. So they sometimes prayed three times a day. We find that Daniel goes to his house, opens up a window toward Jerusalem, and prays three times a day. And these people know that. So look what happened in verse 10. It said, Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in the roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had done previously. He always did that. He prayed toward Jerusalem. This is a picture we, got, we found. It, of course, that's not him, but it, I think it looks a lot like him. But anyway, there's Daniel, and he's praying to God, and he prays three times a day. Why? And he prayed toward Jerusalem because in 1 Kings chapter 8, when they built the temple, Solomon said, O oh Lord, if we're ever taken off into captivity, if we're scattered around the world, wherever we are, if we will turn toward this place and pray toward you. And so Daniel is following the scripture, and he says, I'm just going to pray toward toward Jerusalem three times a day in the morning, at noon, and in the afternoon. That's what he did. 
And so he was praying, and these people knew it, and so they waited, they looked, there's the window open, there he is praying. They came at nine in the morning, they watched, they came back at 12 and watched, they came back at three and watched, and then they went to the king, and verse 11 says, then these men came by agreement, and they found Daniel making petition and supplication. So then they went to the king, and they went to the king and said, didn't you make this law that says any, nobody can pray to anybody but you? And he went, yeah. They said, well, this Daniel is praying three times a day, and he's praying to his God, not you. He's got to be thrown in the lion's den. Well, the king went, oh, my gracious, because Daniel was his best man. And he thought, oh, what am I going to do? And he spent the whole day trying to figure out a way to get out of this. But you remember, the law of the Medes and Persians cannot be changed. The law of the Babylonians, the king was supreme in the Babylonian Empire. So he could make any law he wanted to. He could do anything he wanted to. But under the Medio persian Empire, the king did not. He was not sovereign. If there was a law, the king couldn't change the law. So they've already made a law that you're going to get thrown in the lion's den if you pray to anybody other than the king. And so they come to him and they say, he's got to be thrown in the lion's den. And so this morning we're going to see that he's going to be thrown to the lions. Look at verse 16. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, let me just read this part. Look what he says. Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. We'll come back to that in just a second. They took Daniel and they threw him in the lion's den. They don't picture a, like a cave. The best that we can understand is the lions were kept underground. And there was a hole in the, uh, the, in the top and they would pull it by, they would drop a person down or let a person down into the lion's den and cover it back up and then the lions, of course, would come eat them. That's what would happen. So when it says, the king gave orders and Daniel was brought and cast in the lion's den, they let him down into that hole. That's what they're doing. It's like a hole in the earth, lines kept, covered over the top. They threw him down in there. We'll talk more about it in a minute. Look what he says. The king says to Daniel at the end of verse 16, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Now, that looks like the king is saying, don't worry, Daniel. I'm throwing you in the lion's den, but I know your God that you've been praying to three times a day. He will deliver you. Well, that's not exactly yeah, that's how it looks. In the, it, this is an Aramaic section, and it could be a question. We're not sure. It, it, the way it's written in the language, it could either be a statement, your God will deliver you, or it could be a question, your God will deliver you? Like, I hope so. And so we don't really know exactly whether he actually think, thought that God was going to protect him or not. But I want you to notice several things that the king says. The last of verse 16, he says, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Notice what he said, constantly. You serve constantly. That's how he looked at Daniel. He said, Daniel always serves his God. Could the same be said about us? I mean, think about it. How do we serve? How do you and I serve God? When it's convenient? When we must? Out of habit or constantly like a lifestyle? Because that's what Daniel did. Daniel served God all the time. I've been reading this new book by a guy named Kenneth Boa. He went to Dallas Seminary. He was there before me, and he's written several books. And he's, he's, he's one of those guys that uh, writes books that y y makes you think. And uh, the book is talking about the presence of God and going through every day, all day long, thinking about God. Because sometimes we only think about him when we need him. Or when it just comes up, and, and this book is saying, let's keep our thoughts on God all the time. And I think that's what Daniel did, because Daniel you know, served God. And, and whether he was helping the king or whatever he was doing, he did it that way. That's why the Bible says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. That's Colossians 3.17. So do that, and that, that's a powerful thing, and that's what Daniel did. And so... Do we constantly serve God? You know, there's a thing we can do. In Romans 12, I, I use this verse a lot. In Romans 12, 1, he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices. That's the thing. We offer our lives in service to God. And there are so many believers that we trust in Christ as Savior, we have eternal life, or we're going to heaven, and nothing can change that. But we don't live for him at all. We, we get up and we live our own life, and one day when we stand before our Savior, he's not going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. We want him to say, well done. Well, look what happened. 
So a stone was brought and laid, this is verse 17, a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. When they threw Daniel in there and they put the top on it, they put wax around it, and the king had a ring that has his seal on it, and he sealed it, and he had these other rulers do it. That way nobody was supposed to open that up. You couldn't touch it. The, the king had put his seal on it. Does that mean the only person that could open it up was the king? So Daniel is down in the lion's den and he's sealed now I want you to know that even though Daniel is sealed in the lion's den he'd been sealed long ago by the security of God when he believed in the coming Messiah just like when we believe in Jesus who came and died see he lived before Jesus so he's looking forward to the one who's going to come and die and rise again the one who's going to be the savior of the world we look back at the one who already came and died and rose again and when the moment you believe in the Messiah you're sealed until the day of redemption. And so Daniel, he may be sealed in a dungeon in a lion's den, but he's sealed with the security of God. Well, look what happened. Verse 18, Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought in before him, and his sleep fed for, fled from him. Listen, he didn't want to do this. I mean, it's his fault. If he'd have just been more careful when they came and raised this question like prayed only you, if he'd have been thinking, he said, I don't know if that's a good idea. But he signed it, and now he goes, it's too late. I signed it, and my best man, my best man is now in a den, and he's probably being chomped to pieces. That, that's what he thinks. Think about this. If you got this in the contrast, the king got no sleep, and he ate no food. Daniel got sleep, and the lions got no food. I mean, that's really what you think about. I mean, think about it. And, and so Daniel's in the lion's den. I've got several pictures that I found that they're really famous. I don't know if you noticed this, but most people, when they draw a picture of Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel's young in the pictures. Daniel's not young. Daniel's 90 years old. So here's one that Daniel looks older there, and there's the lions, and they're just kind of looking around. And then I've got one like this that looks kind of scary because he's standing there, and these lions are like, we, we, we really feel like we should eat him, but for some reason, we're not. You know, and what we realize is that God protected him while he was there. And so can you imagine Daniel falling down in this hole, looking up, and there are the lions. And they start, listen, we're going to see in a little bit. What were those lions? Somebody said, oh, they just weren't hungry. They weren't hungry. I guarantee you they're hungry. Let me read something to you. I found this. I thought it was pretty neat. It's a, uh, we don't even know who wrote this, but this is a guy describing what he thought it might be like when Daniel was thrown in the last den. Here's what he says. As the guards closed the top and made their way, Daniel slid gradually to the floor of the den. The big lions that had been abounding from their caverns came in with the flow of light, and they stopped short when they saw him. They looked toward this man who stood in their den as easy. Then there was some snorting and whining, and some of them turned around and went back to their caverns. Others of the great beasts yawned and lay on the floor, but no one made a move to the visitor. Thanks be to God, breathed the prophet. He had stopped the mouth of these fierce beasts that they would do him no harm. He sat down on the floor of the lion's den, leaned back against the wall to make himself comfortable. Two lion cubs moved in that direction and laid beside him, one on each side, to give Daniel warmth through the night. Presently, their mother, an old lioness, crept over and lay in front of the prophet. He gently stroked their backs, and each turned their heads and licked his hand. Enclosed by the lioness and her cubs, Daniel slept soundly in perfect peace. Now, I don't know if that happened, but that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Can you imagine Daniel in there? Think about this. I picture that. He's standing there like this, and there's those lions, and they're all growling. And he doesn't know whether they're going to attack him or not. And yet, we're going to see an angel. An angel of God comes and protects him. So watch what happens. So think about it. You're the king. You hadn't slept. You didn't eat. You, you, you're going to lose your, your most favorite one. But you're Daniel. You slept. And you've rested so what happened, verse 19? Then the king rose at dawn at the break of the day, and he went haste to the lion's den. So he gets up, and he wants to know, was Daniel still alive? And when he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. Notice, a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, 
Servant of the living God. Has your God, whom you constantly serve, notice once again, you constantly serve. Has he been able to deliver you from the lions? I like the way he says it. He calls him the li- Do you notice uh, the king calls out and says, Daniel, servant of the living God? Not an idol. Not an idol. See, they worshiped idols. He actually recognized that God's, that Daniel serves a God who's alive. And he says, you constantly serve. And then he says, has this God, notice how he puts it, been able to deliver you from the lion? See, that's not the right question. It's not a question of whether God is able to deliver him. It's a question of if God chose to deliver him. God can do anything. God can do anything beyond what we could ask or imagine. It's not a question of whether God has the power to stop the lines. It's a question, as Daniel would say, it's a question of whether God decided to do it. What about the problems in your life? Everybody got problems. We, if we just had you come up one at a time, we'd say, just give us one of your problems. And all of you could stand there and go, well, I've got a big test coming up on Tuesday. Thank you. Let's go sit down. Next person. And everybody's got problems. Everybody's got problems. How are you going to deal with those problems? You can deal like Daniel did in the lion's den and say, I'm going to trust God one way or the other. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. Look at verse 21. When the king asked back in verse 20, has God been able to deliver you? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. You notice his first words weren't, get me out of here. It was, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. And they have not harmed me in as much as I was found innocent before him, before God, and also towards you. O king, I have committed no crime. You remember the book of Hebrews? Hebrews chapter 11 is called the Hall of Fame of Faith. And it lists by faith, by faith, Noah did this. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Isaac did this. By faith, Jacob. It goes all the way through. Then it gets toward the end. He says, you know, we'd run out of time if we talked about all of them. And so they list some of them. And he says, by faith, conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises. And look at that one. Shut the mouths of lions. It's Hebrews 11.33 where the writer says, that was by faith. Daniel trusted God. He sent his angel. You remember back in the fiery furnace? They threw three in, and the king Nebuchadnezzar looked in and said, I see four of them, and one looks like a son of the gods. That's how he said it. Could have been an angel. Could have been Jesus. Could have been Jesus here. We don't know. So what's going to happen? He's going to be let out. Verse 23. Then the king was very pleased. They gave orders to Dan, for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No injury whatsoever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. It's by faith. Took God at his word. We got to trust God. Even if he doesn't deliver. See, I want you to understand. Daniel didn't know whether he was going to get eaten up or not. All he knew is, I'm going to trust God one way or the other because God has allowed this to happen. I'm not going to stop praying to the true God to pray to a king. So I'm just going to have to trust God in whatever the circumstances are. And there's some of you in this room that when you stand for Jesus Christ in this world, that you go contrary to the culture and you have to trust God that obeying the word of God, you're going to have to trust him for the consequences, whatever they may be. Well, look what happened, verse 24. Then the king gave orders and brought those men who, made malicious, who had maliciously accused, uh, accused Daniel, and they cast them, their children, their wives, into the lion's den. And watch, these lions had they eaten? Watch. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. As they were dropping them in, the lions jumping up to eat them as they came in. The king felt that these people had maliciously accused Daniel. Lions ate these people up before they hit the bottom of the den. Listen, did these people do wrong? Of course they did wrong. Listen, Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. These people did evil and tried to get Daniel killed, and it came back on them. Proverbs 26, 27 basically says the same thing. You dig a hole so somebody else will fall in it. If you're not careful, you're going to fall in it. Pharaoh drowned all the baby boys. What happened to his army? They were drowned. Haman made a gallows, and he was going to kill uh, Mordecai. And what happened to Haman? He got hanged on his own gallows. 
By the way, you, we see vengeance. These people did wrong, it came back on them. The vengeance wasn't from Daniel. And when people do you wrong, just remember this. You don't have to get them back. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. When they do bad things to people, it's going to come back on them. So how do we do it? We leave vengeance to God. Let me read something to you. I'm going to hold, hold my place. We'll flip over. You don't have to turn over there. But look at this. This is Romans 12. Listen to this where he tells us how to deal with these sort of things. He says in verse 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. What Daniel could have done is got out of there and went, okay, where are those guys? Let's throw them in here now. Let's see how they like it. He didn't do that at all. He said, God sent his angel to protect me. Never turn back evil for evil. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Now listen to this. Never take your own revenge. When somebody does you wrong, you do not get them back. Beloved, leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Bible says that you don't have to get people back who do you wrong and who do evil things. God will deal with them in his time and in his way. He goes on to say, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For doing so, you'll heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What do we do with people who do, do us wrong? Leave the vengeance to God. So look at verse 25. Then the king, then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. So he's writing to them. He's going to make a, a deal. He says, I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. Now it's Here's the problem. You can't do that. You can't make people worship God. You can't make people. He made a law that says everybody's got to fear the God of Daniel. Well, you can make a decree, but no, you can't make people worship God. I mean, we talk about all the time about people who trust Christ and they never grow. I mean, they've been Christians 20 years and they still don't grow and their heart's not to, to really grow as a Christian. And sometimes people say things like, what is it we need to do to get these people on fire? There's nothing you can do to get people on fire. You can give them all the opportunities in the world and love them. Oh, it's got to come. It's got to come from within. It's got to come from how God works in their lives. And so here's this king making a decree that everybody's got to fear the God of Daniel. Not going to happen, but it is a decree. And then he goes on to say, for he is the living God and he enduring forever. And his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He delivers, rescues, performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Look how he describes God. He's a living God. He's eternal. He has an eternal kingdom. He is a savior, and he has power. That is how Darius, king of the Medes and the Persians, probably under, under Cyrus, he described Daniel's God in that way. Now, that's our God. Is he a living God? He is. He's a living God. He's alive and powerful, and, and he's an amazing. Is he eternal? Psalm 90 from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He's the eternal God. Does he have an eternal kingdom? Yes, he does. When he comes back to this earth, he'll set up a kingdom for a thousand years on this earth, and then he'll set up what we call the eternal kingdom with a new heavens and a new earth. Is he the Savior? He is. Jesus Christ is called the Savior. We're going to see it when we study, of course, uh, the birth of Christ. But Joseph has said, you shall name him Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. And last but not least, he is all-powerful. And so how do we look at God as the living God, as eternal, the eternal kingdom, the savior, the power, a pagan king, the best we can tell. That's how he saw the living God. It ends with a little statement at the end. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Cyrus and in the, excuse me, the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. We know that Darius became king at age 62. The best that we can tell from history, he did not live very long. So he didn't serve, so Daniel didn't serve under Darius very long, but he served under Cyrus, the king of Persia. Now, we talked about Cyrus. I just want to throw this out. We talked about Cyrus last, last week. Cyrus was the king that when he ruled the world of the medial Persian empire, God stirred up his heart. And according to Jeremiah, and Second Chronicles, Cyrus decided 
the nation of Israel would leave captivity and go back home to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. Cyrus made that decree and Cyrus paid for it. And that's going to happen. We'll talk more about it as we study the book of Daniel. So what have we seen? That Daniel was willing to die to obey God's word. He was accused and thrown in the lion's den. The king tried to get, out, get him out of it, but it didn't work. When he came in the next morning, Daniel was protected. He had threw the accusers into the den, and he made a decree for all to fear the God of Daniel. So as we think about this, uh, Darius will die and Cyrus will continue to rule. Let's be men and women of character. Let's think about it. Let's live by the Bible. Let's live according to the Word of God. Let's obey the Bible and always obey the Bible, even if the laws of our country, if they go contrary to the Bible, we have to obey the Bible rather than the laws. Romans 12, offer your life. Say, Lord, I want my life to count for you. Are you and I willing to stand for God's truth in a fallen world? That's the question. Second. Let's serve. Let's serve our great God. I mean, think about it. Let's serve him. How do we serve him? When it's, you know, how do we serve him? When it's convenient or as a habit or constantly, as the Bible talks about. We want to live for him. We want to do our jobs for the glory of God. We want people to see that we're different because we love our Savior. The third thing is we just got to trust him in the trials of life. I mean, there, there, there. There are lines in your life right now. There are problems. How do we deal with these problems? Even when we don't know how it's going to turn out, we have to to trust God. He is able to do beyond what we could ask or imagine. And last but not least, let God deal with those who hurt us. Let God deal with those who hurt us. Because let me tell you, uh, be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you reap and whatever you sow, you also reap. It's going to happen. And it's going to come back. And that's why the Romans passage is so powerful. Don't return evil with evil. Return evil with good. Leave vengeance for the Lord. Don't try to get somebody back. Let God handle it. And he always does. May we trust in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We seek to serve him. We seek to live for him. Even in the problems and the trials of life, may we trust him. 